uh, was good. And I liked your cat there, I really did. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys today about, um, we're starting the nervous system, we're starting the brain and how the nervous system functions. And so <clears throat> I want to start, um, let me see here, hold on. Let me actually, no, let me take roll at the end because people are still signing on. So let me start with the test review kind of thing. So that's that four page document that sort of has the main points that I want you guys to be familiar with um, uh, for the test uh, highlighted. And so let me share my PowerPoint with you guys. <clears throat> All right, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yep, yes. All right, so when it comes to the fundamentals of the nervous system, so that's, I think, page two of the review, middle of the page. Uh, we want to highlight the fact that the nervous system is a has a central nervous system that's in the core, that's the center, uh, uh, that's the brain and the spinal cord, that's sort of a computer like part of the nervous system that makes decisions that that integrates information and then we have cables and those are the nerves here coming out going down the arm going down the legs anything into the periphery uh, is known as the peripheral nervous system um, and that are basically what's in there is cables that connect um, the body tissues with the central nervous system and then what we have is we have um uh, when we look at the basic functioning, uh, we go kind of go back to the negative feedback loop that we did early on in the semester where you have something happening, a receptor picking up a piece of information here. It's like you get pricked uh, with a pin and it hurts. And so the pain nerve gets activated and beats information into the central nervous system, into the spinal cord. And in there we have a, an integration. And then from there we get... Um, <clears throat> The, the, uh, the, the decision made of what do we need to do with the situation, that motor uh, product goes out of the spinal cord here into the muscle and we retract that finger so we're not getting poked anymore. And of course, that's a reflex right in here. Uh, but it's basically like the negative feedback loop. It's the same thing. So we have a sensory impulse information going in to the CNS from the periphery from you know this this a here is all the way from the finger all the way up to here to the spinal cord and then in the spinal cord we make the decision to retract the finger and a, a motor output an impulse um, uh, a motor nerve is sent to a muscle to also to a gland or to another nerve but it's sent out of the spinal cord all the way down the arm to the finger muscles and then we retract that finger <clears throat> away from um, the danger area. And so when you look at these nerves we have in these peripheral nervous system, most of the nerves carry both motor information going out nerves and sensory information going in nerves uh, um, together. So most of those nerves are then uh, ultimately we'll have a little thing there. They're known as mixed nerves. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so... That's the peripheral nervous system, that's the central nervous system, and that's the um, 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 receptor and that loop. And so then from there, when we talk about the fundamentals of the nervous system, we go and discuss electricity itself and how electricity is, is made by um, electrons moving around and, and in the body, what we can do that we, we can use ions to 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 move electrons or move charges around in the body. So we have a chemical, which is the ion that can hold a charge. And when we move that chemical, the charge goes with it. And so we can do that in the body and have an electrical current go through the system that way. Um, <clears throat> so then we get into, you know, that's what this is all about here. Um, um, and then the boundary is the cell membrane. That's what that is about. But then we get into voltage. Um, and, and, and that's where it becomes important that we understand voltage is the difference between the charge on the inside 
and or, or the difference between the charge and two points and in the body we measure the inside of the cell membrane and the outside of the cell membrane and generally speaking it's polarized in a way that the inside of the cell membrane is slightly negative than the outside of the cell membrane um, and then what happens is when we have a nerve impulse we open some channels and we have a situation established where we have a lot, a lot of um, sodium on the outside of the cell membrane, the extracellular area. That's right here. It's upside down on the other slide, but that's the outside. So we have a lot of higher concentration of sodium on the outside and not that much on the inside. So the concentration is much higher. So if we open um, channels that let sodium go from a, area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And the cool thing is by having established this concentration difference, this gradient, we can use passive transport of sodium, uh, 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 which is much faster than active transport. Uh, active transport uses ATP. And so we actually establish the fact that we have much more sodium on the outside than the inside by sodium potassium pumps, which use ATP, but they're continuously just pushing those chemicals from to the outside and to the inside, sodium to the outside, potassium to the inside. Um, and so then when we have a nerve impulse, all we do is open a gate and sodium will float in passively uh, down the concentration gradient and brings a positive charge to the inside of the cell. And that is known than as depolarization because we take away from the polarity, from the difference between the inside and the outside when we make the inside right in that area where the, recept where the channel is more positive and actually flip the polarity for a hot second. So that's why the term depolarization means we decrease the polarization. When we, when we look at that, um, when we now then talk about the nerve impulse, we look at that here, the, the, the polarity the difference between the inside and the outside of the cell is negative or is 55 to 70 millivolts. So the inside is more negative by 50 to 70 millivolts, which is just a number of value, but you know, that's how we measure it um, compared to the outside. And so um, 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 when we then open the sodium channels, the sodium comes invert and that's depolarization and that shoots that uh, impulse, that, that graph upward that measures um, voltage and brings it to a positive on the inside of positive 30 millivolts. And then at that point, the sodium channels close and we have um, potassium channels open and the potassium concentration on the inside of the cell is much greater than the outside. And so when the channels open, the potassium will float out and bring neg a positive charge with it going to the outside. Um, and that leaves the inside more negative again. And then that means we repolarize, we bring the polarity back um, to the situation. And then um, we have a little bit of a dip happening here because the potassium channels open slowly, uh, they close slowly. Um, and, and so we overshoot it a little bit, but that will balance out because continuously what's happening, we have this sodium potassium pump working and always taking three sodiums to the outside of the cell and two sodiums, uh, potassiums to the inside of the cell and creating that concentration gradient through that process. Um, and then th th that's what needs to be reestablished. And so that's a refractory period where we can have a nerve impulse while those chemicals are mixed up, but it takes you know milliseconds to get the chemical environment reestablished that we can then have a next nerve impulse where we open the sodium channels shoot up the electricity, close the sodium channels, bring the positives back out um, and, and reestablish that electrical environment. So the nerve impulse can pass through a nerve that way. Um, does that make some sense or is that very confusing? I think it makes sense. <clears throat> okay. It, it's one of those topics where, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to grasp and so it's, it's good to be exposed a few times. So if you have challenges with this process, you speak up or shoot me a text and we can work on it some more. But that's basically how a nerve impulse functions, fundamentally speaking. Um, so good. With that, we then move on to um, 
um, the next topic, and that's the neuron, the microanatomy. So sort of how does the stuff looks when we look at the small, uh, smallest of smallest units. And, and so we look at two nerve types in the nervous tissue that we differentiate um, fundamentally. And one is the neuron and the neuron is the nerve cell and that's responsible to receive stimuli, to process stimuli and to conduct impulses. When we look at the neuron structure, we have a cell body here. And then we have, that's a goofy looking little thing. Let's look here. We have a cell body in the middle here. And then we have extensions going in one direction. So they are like fine haired or, you know, this kind of looking things. And then on the other side, we have one long extension that goes out to the end where it sort of spreads out a little bit again. Um, <clears throat> And that's where we see how a nerve is made up. So dendrites are the extensions that come out from the cell body. Um, they're branching processes and they're receiving stimuli from other neurons. And then they transmit those stimuli that they receive to the cell body. And the cell body is the pericardion. They call that, or soma, they call that in the nerve, in the neuron. And that's the metabolic center. That's where everything happens. That's where we... Where, where we make the neurotransmitters, for example. And then from there, we have an axon that goes, that's that one long extension that originates at a little narrow base here, this here, that's known as the axon hillock. Um, that's in a different picture coming up. And then the axon goes all the way along um, the nerve. In the nerve, when we look at peripheral nerves, these are basically axons. Um, this can be as long from the lumbar spine to the big toe. I mean, this could be very long, like a yard long if necessary, or very short. But that's where we carry the nerve impulse down. And then at the end here, the axon terminals is where we release the chemicals that then go to the um, next uh, nerve or to a muscle or to a gland and do their magic on those um, cells. Um, so those are the three main things that make up a neuron. Um, and so when we look at the nerve, the neuron cell, it's a cell that receives stimuli, processes stimuli, and then conducts impulses. So we got the, the dendrite, the soma, the body, cell body, and then the axon here. And then we got the other nerve type, and the other nerve type style is the glia cells, the, also known as neuroglia, and glia means glue, and they provide the neurons with nutrients and physical support and take care in the immune system and also help the nerve be insulated. Um, when you see these little things here, these white things, this is insulation going around the nerve and actually that helps the nerve impulse travel much faster than if we don't have uh, these insulations because wherever there's insulations, you can't have ion exchange. So you have these little gaps where you have the ion exchange the sodium potassium and so this nerve impulse chomps and that speeds it up greatly so this is pretty cool stuff as far as i think and um and then the next part we want to talk about is the synapse and the synapse is <clears throat> um composed of three things mainly when we just um, talk about it it's the it's the neuron that brings the impulse down to the axon terminal. And this is where we have a chemical release. So when the nerve impulse comes down, the vesicles with, with the neurotransmitters get secreted and released. The neurotransmitters get released into a space, it's an haptic gap or cleft. <clears throat> and then from there, um, there on the other side, the post synaptic. Um, membrane, we have receptors and the neurotransmitter has, you know, can hook on to the receptor and then whatever happens the, from the receptors and happens, for example, we have a muscle contraction. Um, and so that's how that works. That's very similar to the endocrine system in terms of how that process works, to, that the chemical has a receptor to attach to and then the receptor does the work on the inside um, of a cell. So we have a presynaptic membrane, a narrow intercellular gap or a synaptic cleft, it's also called that, and then a postsynaptic membrane. And then last but not least is 
on that front is the nerves here. And I talked about that. When you look at nerves, we have basically axons that travel either away from the central nervous system as in motor neurons or towards the central nervous system as in sensory neurons. And so this, the, the sensory neurons are also known as afferent neurons. And the motors are also known as efferents. And most nerves in the periphery, like the funny bone that you hit here by the elbow, if you choose down into the pinky, those are mixed nerves. Most of those are mixed nerves. Some of them are just having either afferents or efferents in it, either sensory or either motor. A couple of the, the cranial nerves, the nerves that come out of the brain, but are kind of peripheral nerves that feed the or the eyes, the ears, and all that stuff. Some of them are like the one with the eye seeing is just a sensory nerve, the optic nerve. It's not it's not having to have motor function. Uh, the motor function goes to goes to the muscles of moving the eyeball around. Um, so but anyway. Um, that's, you know, when we see some that are not mixed nerves, but most of them in the periphery, in the arms and the legs um, are mixed nerves. All right, so that is that. Let's see, then we have the next thing I want to do after that is I want to get to the brain. And when we do the brain, we're going to go with the term list. And I have... Um, and we do part brain part one and part one is basically getting us through the lobes or at least that's where i'm cutting part one off for this practical portion so when we look at the brain um we have um developmentally speaking it's sort of interesting. It has a long tube and then the top portion of the tube grows out and that becomes the brain. And so we have a main, a diencephalon, a, 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 the wiggle stuff on the outside of the brain. That's where we have consciousness and thinking and all that stuff going on. And, and the outside, there's the cell bodies. And then we have a, a, a part more in the, in the middle we have, uh, uh, no, then that's the, the diencephalon is also part of the forebrain. So that's, right in here where those two two parts come together with the diencephalon the big structure there will be the thalamus uh for us and the hypothalamus which we talked about in the endocrine system um those are sort of well the hypothalamus is, is really interesting because it connects the emotions with the physicality so we um, have you know em emotional things can create hormonal responses in there and have long-term effects on the body i um, mean the thalamus is very interesting because it's a uh, it's a relay station where we where we filter uh, incoming information through and sort of get a crude recognition. So that that's a very interesting part of the brain, I think. And then from there we get more into the into the uh, midbrain and and then the hindbrain, which is the pons and the medulla oblongata, further down towards the spinal cord. And things down there are more happening in a in a reflexive way, not in a conscious way. Um, and and so what's interesting is the brain. Um, is sort of structured layer wise structured. So we have this old, old salamander type brain where we have reactions to um, stimuli and, and things. And it's very, and, and, and then we have a more, uh, a higher order brain that, that also has the, the limbic system is kind of part with that, the emotional brain. And then we get a higher functioning brain where we do the cognitive thinking and the full consciousness um, in there. And so it's kind of a, an interestingly layered structure, both from a functional as well as from a structural perspective. Um, and so today, the main um, components that uh, we look at in the brain is the fact that we have two hemispheres in the brain. So we have a long, long longitudinal fissure, that's one of the terms, going um, all the way down, all the way down to this portion here, which is a part that brings the right and the left hemisphere together. And so these here, this is all a space. So this brain here is its own side. And then this brain here is its own side. And you see it here, of course, much easier. So that's the left and the right brain side. But if you have to be careful with labeling left logical, right, creative. It's more like left, uh, right, bigger picture thinking kind of things, left 
more step-by-step -step execution thinking and then the cerebellum has a lot of to do with it too so we're learning more and more that you know the brain is a very very complicated structure and so what we do in here is we touch on some fundamentals um, to try to start creating that understanding um, process and i just understand it fragmented so it's you know but it's in, it's very very interesting it's just it's very hard for a brain to study a brain you know that kind of where we hit some limits um so we have then from so they have the hemispheres and the longitudinal fissure and then we have all this area where there's wiggles and the wiggles are known as gyri and the little grooves here are known as sulci a, a fissure is a deep a fissure is a deep sulcus it's a deep groove like a huge valley these are just sort of like shallow grooves here the sulci and so but we have a few that we want to name that are important it helps us orient ourselves around the brain with understanding which wiggle is where and we can map things out a little bit um the, the big one that we understand as a sulcus is the one that separates the front part of the brain the frontal lobe with the the second the more to the, the the top part the parietal lobe and so these are actually named which is kind of kind of cool by you know what the skull plates are so if you study those which we did you have it, those lobes of the brain pretty straight up um already studied for the most part but so we have the frontal lobe the parietal lobe and then we have the occipital lobe which is in the back and on the side by the ear, this is retracted here, but on the side by the ear, we have the temporal lobe. You see it right here, that's the temporal lobe right in here. What's happening with this brain here is they retract that temporal because underneath it, we have an extra lobe here that we don't have a bone for because it's hidden. And that is known as the insula, the island lobe. So those are, um, the five lobes that we want to identify on the outside of the structure um, of the brain. And so that's why we have consciousness going on and thinking going on. So we have a few, um, um, the, if we, can, we have a few descriptions, functional descriptions to those. So the frontal lobe deals with motor commands, working memory, judgment, problem solving. Um, um, the parietal lobe is more sensation, how we experience the world physically with touch, temperature, pain. Um, and then we have the gustatory lobe we have is taste. Uh, we have a visual cortex in the, in the occipital lobe and the primary acoustic cortex in the temporal lobe. So those are sort of the big ones. Uh, what's interesting is we have within those lobes, we have primary areas and association areas. And so we have areas the association, the primary areas is begin, contains the beginning or termination of project of pathways. So that's kind of where we have the consciousness or we send an impulse off where we receive stimuli or we send some stimuli off. And then the association areas um, surround them and process information. And so we have, that's where we have these primary acoustic cortexes. Where are they located? And that's where they're, located right here for example the hearing the primary area for hearing is right here so that's the end point of the pathways um, and the other parts are association areas so they give us interpretation of what does that mean when you hear this voice oh i heard this voice before oh that's my cousin's voice oh my god it's family and so then that happens all in association areas um, but the primary consciousness is in the primary area and so we have a couple of these primaries we want to we want to point out and they are right here um, in front and behind here in front and behind the central sulcus and so structurally speaking we call them pre and post central gyrus and here we go so pre and post central gyrus so the pre central gyrus is in front pre is in front of the central sulcus and the post central gyrus is right behind the central sulcus um, and the pre central gyrus is the primary motor cortex and so that's a responsible place for executing voluntary movements so if i want to stand up and contract my quadriceps 
I will send a modal command from here to my quadricep. I can consciously do that. I can consciously make my thigh muscle contract. That's pretty darn cool. Um, and so that's where that comes from. And the primary sensory area is where we have, um, where we experience those sensations consciously. So, ow, that hurt when somebody picked me or, oh, that's nice and warm and not, you know, something like that. Um, so touch, physical sensation, temperature, pain, that stuff. Um, and so what's very interesting is that these wiggles, these, these two wiggles, the pre and post central gyrus, they have mapped them out and they have a little homunculus to call them. They have mapped out which body part is represented where and how big and how much is that representation. And so the red one is the pre central gyrus as a motor. And the blue one is the post central gyrus, that's the sensory. Um, and so this is what they call a homunculus. So that's a depiction of a claimation of, of how, the, how, how many receptors are in which part of the body, for example, for the sensory. So you see the hand, of course, is huge, and then the back is small, uh, uh, for example, or the arm in, in comparison. And so you can put your hand in your pocket and figure out, oh, what kind of coin that is. But when you would have to feel the coin with the back, you can barely figure out that there's something touching the back um, or how big it is because the sensory receptors are much further apart. In massage, I use that if I want to give somebody a good, you know, I spread my fingers apart. And they think a big old, big, big hand is touching their back and massaging them because you don't have as many receptors that you can feel between the fingers necessarily. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing there. And so that's, but structurally speaking, what we look for to test, that's the pre-central gyrus and the post-central gyrus, um, where that is. And then last but not least, I think for today, we have the little hind brain here. And that's the cerebellum in the back here, the cerebellum. Good. All right, you guys, how is that? Good. Then, you know, what we should do, I think, because there's a short class today, but I think we should go back and, and do, a, do, a, do a, little, a little small quiz, and then we can close out early. So how about you guys take out a sheet of paper, and I am going to pull down some pictures, maybe, maybe not. There we go. All right. You guys have a sheet of paper out? Yeah. And, and your term list. And so first, what I want you to tell me is, or write down, is when you have here the aorta coming up, you have these three stumps coming out uh, right off of it. What is the first one called? Write me that down as number one. The first artery that comes off of the aortic arch. Number two is right here too. I want you to tell me what's the vessel called that comes right off the um, um, uh, uh, right ventricle. Sorry, the vessel that comes off of the right ventricle. What is this one called? And number three is also right on this one. And I'll give you some room to write down. But number three is this valve here. What is this valve called? All right, number one, number two, number three. And then we move on to, oh, hold on. I need to, of course, move. How do I do that? There we go. Sorry about that. Move back. So there's the blood. I thank God it goes faster than I think. So then we do a few of those. I want you to tell me on the white blood cells, I have these three types. The granules are looking similar to the background. The granules are kind of reddish. The granules are kind of bluish. What's this one called? That's number four. Number four. And number five, I want you to tell me the big one. What's that one called? So number four. 
and number five. And if I'm too fast, stop me. Otherwise, we go right here, and this is the brain. And today we're gonna do some lobes. No, not only. So I wanna, give me the name of this lobe here. This is the posterior side, this is the anterior side. I want to give me the lobe here that's in the anterior most portion of the brain. It's number six. And then number seven is the one in the back, the furthermost back lobe. Six, the one in the front, seven, the one in the back. And then eight is this brownish, more brown part of the brain. What's that one called? And that number eight and number nine, last one. I tell you, this here is the central sulcus. Now, what's the wiggle before in front of the central sulcus called? Good. Now, we'll go backwards. Everybody speak all at once as much as you can. What's number nine? Uh, pre, pre, pre central gyrus. gyrus. Good job. Pre central gyrus. What's number eight? Cerebellum. Cerebellum. Excellent. Number seven. <laughs> Occipital lobe. Occipital lobe. Great. Number six, frontal, frontal lobe. lobe. Frontal lobe, very well. Hold on, I'm now a little slow here. Hang with me. Number <coughs> five, monocyte. monocyte. And number four, neutrophil. neutrophil. Neutrophil, very well, very, very good. And number three, uh, atrioventricular valve. Atrioventricular valve, yeah. And we have, you know, if you put bipolar or bicuspid, tricuspid, or mitral valve, these are also good names. But the one I'm looking for from the term list is the AV valve. And then number two, pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary vein. Pulmonary trunk. It it would be an artery because it leaves the heart. And this, when an artery is very short and then it splits very fast afterwards, they often call it the trunk. And so this first portion is the pulmonary trunk, and then these will be pulmonary vein uh, arteries. See, I make the mistake too. They're arteries, even though they're blue. This is the place, the one place where the blue is an artery. Um, and I'm not having that on the list because that way we're not too confused. But I want you to know that for a future class. And so then number one is this one. What was that? Brachiocephalic trunk. Very good. Brachiocephalic trunk. And again, the fact that it is a trunk makes you know it will split very fast after it comes out of the aortic arch. And since the heart is on the left, mostly, the brachiocephalic trunk comes over towards the right and then splits off into a right subclavian and a right carotid, external carotid artery, which is what comes off of here. The left, the left uh, common carotid towards the head, neck, medially, and then the last stump is the subclavian, which is the main artery that goes into the arm and feeds blood to the arm. That makes sense? Yes. yes. Was that the brachiocephalic trunk? Is that refers to all three of those like um, extensions you just pointed to, or is that just the first one? 
No, this is the first one. So the first one is the brachiocephalic trunk. And since the heart is on the left side more, it, it has a little bit of a pathway where it goes as a trunk and then it splits into a subclavian and into a carotid. Got it. We don't okay. see that, right? I, I think I have a picture in the booklet where it shows that. Uh, or yeah, for sure. uh, and then the other ones come straight out of the arch uh, directly. So the, the left common carotid comes out of here and the left subclavian comes out of here, goes under the clavicle. Laura, sorry, I made you repeat that. Thanks. No, that's all right. That's very, you know, you know, these are things, if we get them once right, then we know them. You know, it's kind of that kind of stuff. So I'm not having a problem mm -hmm. at all repeating myself. I think it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Good. But from my perspective, that's all I have for today. I want to take some role. If you have questions, speak up. If you have comments, speak up. I got Tanaya. Here. Sarah. Here. Koa. Here. Kyla May. Here. Kawai. Here. Narcy. Here. Here. Mannery. Here. Jamuna. Here. And Veronice. Here. Wonderful. Good. So this was not the longest class, but you guys deserve it. You've been doing great work. We can close it out early. If you have wanna, if you have questions, you can stay after, or just send me a text and we can talk offline. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Bye.